So, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly Father, we call upon your holy name, and your name is Father, Son, and Spirit. We ask particularly that the Holy Spirit inspire our gathering here and reflection upon the great gift of yourself through the Spirit. This we ask through Christ the Lord. Amen. Amen. So, um, you know, these are uh, my own personal reflections. So they're not theological treaties that, you know, you can get credit for at any theological school. Uh, but if you want that, you, you just go, uh, you go online for a theology course, okay? That wasn't in the bulletin. Yeah, that wasn't. He wasn't getting credit, so I'll write So uh, the Holy Spirit knows that you're here. And so one of the things, um, I mean, I, just my own experience is that I remember the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. We grew up with the ghost. And I wasn't so sure as a child that the ghost was a friendly ghost. Is that a friendly ghost? I guess it's a friendly ghost. And like, what kind of ghost are we talking about? So uh, as a child relating to the Holy Ghost, uh, you know, God the Father was pretty easy um, Jesus, yes, uh, yes, good stories, uh, but uh, the Holy Spirit came last. And, uh, and who is the Holy Spirit? How do you relate to this, this Spirit? I remember at Confirmation, they always talk about the gifting of the Holy Spirit, that we are, the, you know, you, you will receive the Holy Spirit. All right, so I, and they built it up and talked about how exciting it was and everything like that. And I, I remember in the seventh grade, I went up and the, the bishop uh, tapped me on the face, which we anticipated. It was very gentle. Uh, so uh, not a great test of my, Christian, uh, my Christianity to turn the other cheek. You know, it wasn't that hard to turn the, didn't even have to turn the cheek. Um, but uh, he laid hands on me and, and I, I I uh, uh, went went away, you know, turned, went back to the pew, and I thought, I don't, I didn't feel nothing. Uh, maybe I need to get back in line. Maybe I didn't get it. You know what I mean? It was like, uh, when I supposed to get the Holy Spirit? What what did it work? Am I worthy? What what went wrong? You know, uh, because I had this expectation because the church proclaims the gift of the Holy Spirit, and I wondered about it, you know, and I wondered about it, I wondered about it for quite a while, you know. So that is my early experiences of the Holy Spirit. And then of course I was ordained and the bishop laid hands on me, and I felt something then. Uh, all the priests were asked then to lay hands upon the newly ordained. And uh, there, there, a spiritual, a sense, a spiritual sense of being blessed, being prayed over but blessed, and a feeling of, of peace and power was a powerful experience. Uh, I began to understand and identify the Holy Spirit so the Holy Spirit is always uh, present. It's a matter of recognizing the Holy Spirit. One of the things that uh, Paul says is no one can call Jesus Lord except in the Holy Spirit. So is Jesus Lord? Do you, do you believe that Jesus is the Lord of heaven and earth? that he is the Lord, our God, the image of the invisible God. Is he, is he present? Is Jesus in this room right now? Do you, do you sense that? Do you feel that? Do you believe that? Yeah. Well, only in the Holy Spirit can you, can you know that. If you know that, if you believe Jesus is present, then you have the Holy Spirit because you cannot know it apart from the Holy Spirit. That's the only way you can know the risen Christ and that he is our Lord. 
that he is powerful, that he is, that's the only way. So you say, well, I've never experienced the Holy Spirit. I said, well, first you have to ask yourself, is Jesus Lord? I mean, do you believe, do you feel, do you experience that? If you do, you've, you've got the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is with you and it's active and, and gives witness to, to his presence in you because of that. Now, do you know the fullness of the presence and the lordship of our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, if you're holier than me, you might. We don't. There's a mystery of the meaning of God. And mystery means it's so big, it's infinitely big. And we grasp parts of it, pieces of it, hopefully more than we did when we were in the second grade or in the seventh grade, that our life experiences have exposed us to encounter God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, that is evidence. So some people feel like they're really left out. You know, they don't have, the, you know, some people, you know, are charismatic in their spirituality, <clears throat> praising the Lord and Feel, you know, we're filled with the Holy Spirit and other people are like, eh, I, don't, I don't feel nothing. I mean, I don't got that electricity going on. I don't know what they're talking about. Um, but the main issue, I think, is that people don't recognize the Holy Spirit. So, for example, is Jesus Lord? Do you believe in our Lord Jesus Christ? If you do, then you're in touch with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is active in you. And there are other ways to notice the presence and identify the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. Now, I just want to say that um, uh, the role of the Holy Spirit. So when we're talking about the Holy Spirit, we're talking about one of the three persons of, of the Trinity. And we ex have experienced God uh, and we have a tradition that passes on to us. What tradition means, you pass on something. That's a tradition, all right? So uh, from one person to another, one generation to another, the tradition has been that, um, that God is Trinity, that Father, Son, and Spirit is a community of persons. I just was reading a book by Richard Rohr on uh, the Trinity, and it really is a, a, a powerful and good reflection upon this God as a community. And of course, you know, if, if it said God was a Martian, I'd go like, I don't know nothing about that. You know, what's a Martian? I have no idea. Uh, have no relate, you know. But God is a community of persons well, I think about my own experience, you know, me, myself, and I, you know, came, yeah, did, yeah, me, myself, and I. I have a relationship with myself. Sometimes I like me, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm disappointed, sometimes I'm encouraged. Uh, so I, I have a relationship with myself. Sometimes it's a loving one and sometimes it's not. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself. We have a relationship with ourselves. We're not schizophrenic, multiple personalities, three, 10 people in one body. We're a, a person, but we have a relationship, that personhood of us has a relationship with ourselves. And in some ways, I think that's the way I can connect to the relationship God has with himself. And how do we notice this relationship of God to himself? That it's a, it's a relationship of love. God loves himself, which is really good because it now spills over from God into creation in us. We sh we're sharers of that love of God that didn't say, well, I'm complete and I don't need nothing. I don't want anybody else. I don't want to love anyone but myself. God said, no, this love was meant to be shared. And we believe it did so. 
in his, uh, through his creation and the outpouring of his love for us. Uh, and, and the outpouring of his love was made most manifest in Jesus Christ. He's the image of that invisible God, the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. And then it, at his ascension, when Jesus left the earth, he, he said, I won't abandon you. I'll send another paraclete. And so the, the father and the son sends the spirit. That's how we talk about it. So God continues to be with us, present, through what we call the Holy Spirit. So this relationship with God is a, is a community of love which invites us to join that community, to be a part of God's love and sharers in it. Now, we see, uh, we hear that the angel uh, Gabriel came to Mary and said, Hail Mary, full of grace. Wouldn't you love for an angel to say that about you? Hell, Audie, you're full of God's goodness. Wow. You're like, do, an, does, do, you know, have you, do you know what I know? <laughs> angel of God, my guardian dear. Uh, but that's what the angel saw in, the, in Mary. She was full of God's grace. And uh, it says, you're, 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 you will be the mother of, of uh, the Son of God, and uh, Mary said, well, how is that gonna happen? I, I don't know a man. And he, she, he said, the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Spam, <laughs> not Holy Spirit. <laughs> so, um, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will conceive Thus, the child will be called son of God. So the incarnation is effected by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's how God becomes flesh. Now, you know, at the very beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, uh, he was creating Adam and he made a mud ball. I mean, he gathered some clay and he kissed it. In Genesis, it says he breathed the Holy Spirit, the Ruah of God, the wind, the breath of God, and Adam became a living being. Cut off your breath and see what happens to your life. You die, right? The breath, the life breath. God breathed into Adam and shared life, the life of him. That's how it's described. Well, Jesus breathes on the, on the apostles when he rise, re, rose from the dead. He greets them with peace and he breathed on them and he did not have halitosis and they did not faint. They received the Holy Spirit, the Ruah of God, the wind of God, the breath of God. And so we know in Jesus' own life, we hear about the Holy Spirit coming upon the Blessed Mother. And that is how the incarnation took place, the life of God connected to human life in the person we know as Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. And that Spirit was with him. He grew in grace and wisdom and grace. And when he was 30, he was... He went to the River Jordan and, and led by the Holy Spirit and he was baptized by John, and, uh, which isn't a Christian baptism, by the way. It's only water, not water in the Spirit, but God provided the Spirit. The Spirit came upon him like a dove and said, and said you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And of course, that was tested immediately because the spirit drove him out in a Mercedes Benz into the desert to be tempted. No, he just drove the Holy Spirit, drove him out into the Holy Spirit, into the desert. Why? Because there you have to face difficulty, which will always test the spirit. Deserts are hard places to be hunger, thirst. 
wild beast, demons. You have to face evil. And the devil said, comes to him after 40 days, and he says, uh, <clears throat> if you are so beloved of God, I mean, you know, you're the beloved, right? You're the beloved son of God. If you're so beloved, you know, you're a little bit hungry here. Why, why, you don't have anything to eat. I mean, if you're so special, just, you know, say to this stone, uh, turn in bread, into bread. Show that you are the beloved of God. And Jesus said, not on bread alone does man live, only on the word of God. Well, that didn't work. That temptation didn't work, did it? You know, hunger and thirst and sickness and pain will test us too, whether we're faithful to God and the word of God. Why doesn't God hear my prayers? God isn't listening to me. You know, there's, there's a test. It, it tests us because we don't see God's working and grace in those hardships. You know? So the devil said, no, he's, he's on the word of God. He's, you know, he's going to live by the word of God. Well, I know the Bible. I know those scriptures. And it says in Psalm 93 or whichever one it is uh, that, you know, he, he, will, he will send his angels lest you dash your foot against the stone that God will protect you from harm. Well, you believe that, so jump off the parapet of the temple. It's about 300 feet tall, by the way. Did you know that? The temple wall is at least 300 feet tall. The Romans leveled the temple. Only the first 150 feet. They, they couldn't move at all. They just took the top. 150 feet, which kind of leveled it. So he jump off for 300 feet. And you know, the, the word of God says he'll, he'll catch you, he'll send his angels, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus said, it also says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. You have to listen to the whole word of God. You have to know the meaning of the word of God. And you cannot use it in vain. You shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vanity and vainness. Right? Yeah. So, well, that didn't work. And he said, well, you know, you don't have any power. You want to, you're the Messiah and all that. I got all this power. Worship me and I'll give it all to you. Liar, liar, pants on fire. He goes, guess what? He could have worshipped him, and the devil could not have given him all the power. He only is limited in his power. 666, not holy, holy, holy. Only 666. Holy, holy, holy is 777, you know, the perfect number, the fullness. Evil looks a whole lot like good until you test it and it falls short. If it was a one, you could be able to resist it pretty easy, right? Or even a three. But dang, it's so close to seven. It, it is seduction. Yeah. So, so Jesus was driven by the Holy Spirit and by the power of the Holy Spirit resisted the tempta those temptations. He had others come later in his life, just like all of us. And the Holy Spirit guided him throughout his ministry, um, and um, he, he gave up, it is finished, he gave up his spirit, his breath on the cross. And then he rose from the dead, and he came, even though the doors were locked, breathed on them the Holy Spirit, who sins you forgive, they are forgiven them. The power of God, he shares with the church, and they go from being Freddy cats to willing martyrs for this good news. Amazing what, how it transformed them. All right. So uh, Jesus in his preaching, you ever, I don't know if you ever heard this or not, but um, in the book of Job, it talks about God is talking with the host up there. 
you know, and about human beings and everything like that. And Satan is in heaven. I thought, what in the heck? How could Satan be in heaven? If Satan's in hell. Well, what are they talking about? Well, the Satan is the first prosecuting attorney. If you look, and in the book of Revelation, they accused the, the, those who accused us, the Satans. The prosecuting attorney says, you humans are evil, bankrupt, fickle, and unworthy of eternal life. You're rotten. That's the prosecuting attorney. And you know the prosecuting attorney has a little bit of evidence on us. Doesn't he? But you know, the defense attorney is called a paraclete. That's your defense attorney. Now, Jesus says, when I ascend to heaven, I will send you another paraclete. And you're like, well, who was the first paraclete? Jesus is the first paraclete. He's the first defense attorney for us. Correct? He believes we're worth dying for. Saving. No matter how sinful we may be, he believes in us. He's our defense attorney. He's the first paraclete. And guess where he went when he ascended into heaven? To the right hand of the Father. Yeah. And what's he doing there? He's advocating for us. He's pleading our cause at the right hand of the Father. He's our defense attorney in heaven. Well, who, who's taking care of us down here on the earth? Well, remember, he said, I'm going to send you another paraclete, another defense attorney. And who is that? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit acts as our defense attorney here on the earth. Not because we're perfect but because we need an advocate, right? And so the Holy Spirit, and, and Jesus one time said to his apostles, they were doing miracles and cures and casting out demons. He said, be careful about getting too proud on this. But he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from the sky. And they're like, sounds a little fearsome to me. Like, what's he talking about? Well, you see, why did he see Satan fall like lightning? Because he could see that when he ascended into heaven, Satan no longer had a place at the right hand of the Father prosecuting us. He took his place as our defense attorney. Isn't that a beautiful and powerful understanding of what Jesus is doing? And then also to say, we now have an advocate here on earth called the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. And so the role of the Holy Spirit uh, now in the church, and you'll see this in the Acts of the Apostles, how the role of the Holy Spirit acted in the apostles and in the early church. And um, today... We, we always call upon the Holy Spirit in all of our sacraments. So there's an incarnation. You know how the incarnation happened with the angel Gabriel and the Holy Spirit upon Mary? Well, guess what? Send your spirit upon the gifts of this bread and wine that they may become the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. There's an incarnation, an enfleshment. This is my body. The power of the Holy Spirit makes the body of Christ, the resurrected body of Christ, present to us and we can share it. And why would God want us to share his body? It's eternal life. He shares his life. We are the body of Christ. We become the body of Christ. We're nourished by the body of Christ. That's why he wants us to eat his body and drink his blood so that we share his life now and in eternity. And it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that this bread and wine becomes the bread of life, the bread from heaven. Isn't that powerful? 
And you know, when I forgive sins, you should see my muscles. Yeah, don't look at them, please, because they're not that big. I used to lift 200 pounds of seed, feed, put it right up over my head. Now I can't. It's the power of the Holy Spirit shared with us that we become an instrument of. And so I call the Holy Spirit upon the bread and wine, acting in the name of Christ, called as priest. And you are instruments of the Holy Spirit, too. It's not just the priest thing. It's all of us who get, are gifted with the Spirit. We're called to be instruments of that. So, so anyway, when for the forgiveness, every sacrament, there's a laying on of hands. There's, it's the action that calls to mind the coming of the Holy Spirit, the in, invocation of the Holy Spirit upon them. Because that can not only connect us to the life of God in this Holy Communion, it can forgive our sins, it can heal our mind, our body, and our soul through anointing and the laying on of hands. And you know, for myself personally, um, I, um, I, I feel the Holy Spirit and more and more. I, and I, when I lay hands on people, sometimes I feel resistance. And you think, why in the world would any of us resist the Holy Spirit? We all resist the Holy Spirit. It's called sin. I'll do it my way. So we all, we, all of us are resistant, no matter what degree are we resistant. And sometimes when I've laid hands on people, they're almost like a blockage there. It's like, ooh. Now I'm not judging that person. I, they just might not be ready or something. I don't know what the problem is. I just can feel it, but I can also feel like I can sometimes feel when it let, they let go and the, and the spirit, the feeling flows. There's a flow. It's really quite amazing. I didn't know anything about that growing up that I can remember, but I have, I have experienced the healing. People have talked about through anointing and that, the calm, the peace that comes for them. It can, it's amazing and it's not magic because magic is our manipulation through hocus pocus alamocus. We manipulate reality by our power. It is not magic, it's not our power. It's an openness to God. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. Faith, your faith has saved you. Faith is an openness. Are you blocking God? Are you open to God? You know, how do we open to God and let his spirit flow? And when that happens, God does what God does, which is always blessed and good. So, um, the spiritual gifts, you know, we talk to confirmation kids about the spiritual gifts and seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. By the way, seven is the full number. All spiritual gifts come from the Holy Spirit. And I think there's about 7,000 gifts. Just we can't name all of all, various flavors. But they do name seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. So don't think it's only seven. And I asked the kiddos, I said, what, what spiritual gift do you need? What gift do you want? What's the spiritual gift you want? Sometimes they'll say wisdom or knowledge. I don't know what to do. It's confusing or courage. They'll often name those two. What gift do you need? And so if, what if you, and you know, when you have a need, if you say it to God, if you let him, it, then it opens you to the grace to receive it. 
prayer actually works because it's an opening to the Holy Spirit. All right, now I have gone 35 minutes. <laughs> Are you Give kind of doing this? So thank you all so much for sharing. As you can tell, it's very good and important. God bless you.